Hi, in this video, we're going to talk about bones. Uh, so bone organs as opposed to bone tissue. So an organ being something made of two or more tissues. So whole bones are made of bone tissue and several other tissues. Okay, so bones, every bone is an organ. So I know it's kind of weird to think about it like that because you know, for most people, we think of organs as like visceral organs, like digestive organs and so on. Um, but no, any collection of two or more tissues that form a structure, usually working towards a common goal, uh, that is an organ. So every bone is its own organ. Uh, it's made up of lots of tissues, bone tissue, like we talked about in another video, um, cartilage, dense connective tissues, um, epithelium, red bone marrow, yellow bone marrow, and nerve tissue. Here, let me go back. Okay, so lots and lots of different types of tissues. Uh, so hopefully in anatomy, you talked about your types of tissues. There are four uh, categories of tissue in the body. Uh, that's connective tissue, muscle tissue, uh, nervous tissue, and epithelial tissue. So all the many tissues that make up the entire body fit into one of those four categories. Uh, so bone tissue, cartilage, and dense connective tissues, those are all types of connective tissue. Epithelium is epithelial tissue. Uh, red and yellow bone marrow are connective tissues, and nerve tissue is nerve tissue. Okay, so of our four broad categories of tissue in the body, um, we have three of the four that are part of every bone. Uh, the only type of tissue that's missing in a bone is muscle tissue um, because, well, and actually we could make an argument for there being muscle tissue if we count uh, the blood vessels as being part of a bone. Um, so a bone is very vascular. There are many blood vessels that supply that bone. Um, and there is smooth muscle that is part of every blood vessel. So we could make an argument um, that the smooth muscle that's part of that blood vessel is also part of the bone, in which case we'd have all four types of tissues accounted for. Okay, so anatomical classification of bones. Um, so when we talk about anatomical classification of anything, we're talking about how we classify structures based on how they're built. Uh, physiological classification would be classifying something based on what it does or what its function is. Okay, so anatomical classification, how it's designed, what it's made of, how it's built. Uh, we have five categories of bone classifications. So there's long bones. So that's like your kind of stereotypical bone most of us think of, or you know, people, people who are not uh, knowledgeable of anatomy think of long bones. Uh, so like the femur, humerus, phalanges, and so on. Uh, short bones are like the carpals and tarsals that are more kind of cube shaped roughly. Uh, flat bones would be like the cranial bones and the scapula. Irregular bones are all just kind of the oddball bones that um, are of all kinds of different shapes. So that's vertebrae, some of our facial bones, like we have some really bizarro facial bones. Uh, if you recall from anatomy, uh, we have 14 bones in the face and some of them are very strangely shaped. And so those very strange ones are the irregular bones. And then of course we have sesamoid bones. Those are bones that are embedded in a tendon. Uh, the biggest one in the body is the patella. Pisiform, one of our little carpals, the one that's the most pronounced on the pinky side here. Um, that is a sesamoid bone embedded in a tendon. Um, so those are the two sesamoid bones that count in our 206 bones. Um, but like I mentioned in another video, we actually have several other sesamoid bones in our hands and feet that we don't count in that 206, um, really because they're not as consistent um, from individual to individual. So we have multiple that are in the base of the thumb. We have different ones in different fingers and in our, our toes and the bottom of our feet. Um, so we have a lot of sesamoid bones actually in the body, but they, they tend to be a little bit different from individual to individual. Um, the purpose of a sesamoid bone is to change the biomechanical advantage of a bone 
or sorry, not of a bone, um, of the muscle of the tendon that it's embedded in. Uh, so like, for example, the patella is embedded in the quadriceps tendon or the patellar tendon. And so its purpose is to change the mechanical advantage. Um, so when the quadriceps contracts, it produces force and it transmits that force from the muscle where it's being produced into the tibia where it's attached. And so the direction of that force without the patella would be this direction. So like, here's the quadricep it contracts and pulls, it's pulling this way, the force is going that way. But if the tibia is down here and the force pulls this way, it's just gonna make the tibia do this. It's not gonna actually cause rotation around the knee joint. So for it to cause rotation around the knee joint, we need the patella there to change the direction of the force so that now the force is going up this way instead of this way. Okay, so it's going this way. So now that force causes the tibia to rotate around the knee joint instead of just drawing the tibia in closer to the knee joint. Okay, so I don't know how clear that was with me just making arm gestures, but um, we're, we're gonna get into the biomechanics of that at some point and I'll make sure I draw and um, I'll draw pictures and make sure that that's a lot more clear than what I just did. But I just wanna, help you understand for now the sesamoid bone purpose is to change the biomechanical advantage of a muscle to move a joint. Okay, regions of a long bone. Um, so there's the diaphysis, that's the long shaft of the bone. Um, the medullary cavity is the hollow, it's not empty, but it's, it's the open space inside the diaphysis. On kids, it's full of red bone marrow, and in adults, it's full of yellow bone marrow. The medullary cavity is lined by the endosteum, that's the epithelial lining of the inside of that cavity. Then the ends of the bone, so both ends are called the epiphysis, one epiphysis, two epiphyses, plural. Uh, so there's an epiphysis at either end. Um, so there's a proximal, if we're talking about the limbs, we're talking, there's a proximal epiphysis. That's the one on the proximal end towards the trunk. And the distal epiphysis would be the distal end of the bone away from the trunk. Uh, the epiphyses also have articular cartilage covering the ends. Um, specifically, that's hyaline cartilage. So hyaline cartilage is the type of cartilage, so it's kind of the bluish, um, very slippery um, type of cartilage that when it's in this location for this purpose, we call it articular cartilage. So it's hyaline cartilage is the type that forms the articular cartilage on the bones. Um, so it's called that because that's where two bones will form an articulation. So it's nice and smooth and slippery um, to reduce friction in a joint. Uh, to clarify, we also have hyaline cartilage many other places in the body. And so when it's in other places, it's not articular cartilage because they're not forming articulations. It's only articular cartilage because it's located in the articulation. The metaphysis of the bone is where the diaphysis and epiphysis meets. So there are two metaphyses in every long bone, um, you know, where the two epiphyses are joining to the diaphysis. In the metaphysis is the epiphyseal plate or the epiphyseal line. Uh, the epiphyseal plate is the growth plate. It's the fancy name for the growth plate. Uh, it's a plate of cartilage where the bone is growing in kids and adolescents who are still growing. So Whenever we're building new bone, or we have bones that are growing, first we build cartilage. So we put cartilage there first, and then we convert that cartilage into bone. So that's, that's just how we do it. When we're forming new bone, like in utero, or bones are growing, or we broke a bone and we're repairing it. However, why ever we're building bone, we start by putting cartilage there, because we can do it faster and with fewer materials. And then we gradually, over many months and sometimes years, uh, convert that cartilage into bone tissue. And that's how we build bone. So the epiphyseal plate is this plate of cartilage where we're producing cartilage 
And as the bone is growing, that cartilage is being gradually over time converted into bone tissue. And so it's allowing the bone to grow in length. Then eventually when we're not growing anymore, we convert that whole plate of cartilage into bone. So that, that's when we would say that the growth plate is closed. It means that we've converted all of the cartilage there into bone. And in that case, on an x-ray, you would see an epiphyseal line. Um, so you would just see a line that's evidence of where the growth plate was, um, but it's closed now. So it's all bone, but there's still just kind of like a, a little boundary there of where the two parts of the bone came together when it closed. Okay, and then the periosteum or the perichondrium. Uh, it's a similar situation to the epiphyseal plate. So the periosteum is the outer sheath, the outer covering of the bone. Wherever there is not articular cartilage, the bone is covered in periosteum. Um, perichondrium, chondro means cartilage. So anything C-H-O-N is going to be to do with cartilage. Uh, perichondrium is an outer covering of cartilage. Okay, so like our articular cartilage has a perichondrium covering it. But also <clears throat> in kids where their bones are still growing, anywhere where there is not articular cartilage, their bone is covered in perichondrium, not periosteum. Then when the bone is done growing, the perichondrium converts into periosteum. So it's exactly like with the epiphyseal plate versus the epiphyseal line. It's exactly the same situation, but here the perichondrium is what allows the bone to grow in width. It allows the bone to grow in girth um, instead of in length. So the whole thing is covered in perichondrium. Again, we lay down cartilage and then convert it into bone. And so we're growing bone cells going out this direction instead of the long ways. So we're going out this way. So it's allowing the bone to grow thicker and wider. Um, and gradually we're converting those cartilage cells into bone cells. Then when the bone is done growing, we convert that perichondrium into periosteum. Okay, fractures. Now there are many different types of fractures and this is not a pathology class, so we're not gonna get into all of them. Um, but in general, any fracture, we can determine if it's partial or complete. That just means, is it partial like a hairline fracture or a fracture that does not break the bone into more than one piece? Or is it complete as in the fracture goes completely through and breaks the bone into two or more pieces? Also, any fracture can be determined as closed or open, or synonymously, we could say simple or compound. That is simply saying, did the bone break through the skin or not? So if it's a closed fracture, it means that no matter how many pieces the bone broke into or not, it did not break through the skin. An open fracture means that a piece of bone has broken through the skin. Okay, finally, we're gonna talk about exercise for bone density. Uh, so I'm sorry if my video is covering a little bit of my text here, but again, you can look at the PowerPoint separate from the video. Uh, and this is all also in your course manual. Uh, but stressors are required to strengthen bones. Um, it kind of bugs me when somebody has low bone density and they're given supplements, you know, calcium, vitamin D, uh, they're given supplements, medications to cause them to be more sensitive to those nutrients so they absorb more, um, and that's it, and that's all that they're doing. Uh, that is not going to be effective for increasing bone density. There has to be a stressor on the bone to make the bone get stronger. It's just like if you want stronger muscles, it's not enough to eat a lot of protein. You have to also exercise. You have to lift weights and, and, and put a stressor on the muscles to cause them to strengthen. And the bones operate exactly the same way. Uh, so there needs to be a stressor on bones to cause them to adapt to that stress to add more um, minerals and collagen and make the bone more dense and stronger. 
so really the stressors are gravity and skeletal muscles. So really the best way to increase bone density is to exercise exactly how you would to strengthen your muscles. So as skeletal muscles are getting stronger, they're pulling harder on the bone and the bone has to get stronger and tougher to be able to withstand the pull of the skeletal muscles. Okay, so anything we would do to strengthen our skeletal muscles is also strengthening our bones at the same time. Um, to kind of illustrate that relationship, think about um, if you've ever known someone who's had an avulsion. Um, an avulsion is when the tendon rips right off of the bone. So someone might have an avulsion if they are doing any kind of steroids. So sometimes if people are abusing steroids, what's happening is their muscles are getting stronger because of the steroids, but they're getting stronger faster and disproportionately to how strong the bones are getting. So the muscles are getting stronger and stronger. They're lifting heavier weights. The muscles are pulling harder and harder against the bone. And if the bone tissue hasn't gotten strong enough to withstand that much force pulling on it, the tendon will just rip right off the bone. And that's an avulsion. And sometimes it'll even take a chip of the bone with it. That would be an avulsion fracture. Um, so there are other things that could predispose someone to an avulsion or an avulsion fracture. So there are other things, different disease conditions like diabetes and other things like that. Um, so steroid abuse is not the only time when there would be an avulsion, but that's an example of how um, the relationship between the muscles and, and bone density, they need to get stronger and stronger together on pace with each other and when they're not when the muscle outpaces the bone an avulsion is what happens uh, so how sensitive we are to the stimuli so to the strength training um, or running or whatever it is uh, how sensitive we are depends on age hormones and other metabolic factors in the body uh, that's why uh, postmenopausal women are at much greater risk of osteoporosis is because estrogen, in, in females at least, is very important um, for bone density. It makes us more sensitive to uh, the stress of gravity and the pull of skeletal muscles. Uh, so with less estrogen, you know, once a woman's reached menopause, it makes it makes us a lot less sensitive to those stressors. And so then that's when bone density reduces. Um, in males, the same thing can happen with testosterone, uh, but not all men have lower testosterone with age the same way that women have lower estrogen with age. Uh, so that's why osteoporosis is so much more prevalent in females. Uh, response to stimuli is dose dependent. All we mean by that is that the way the body responds to the stress of gravity or the pull of skeletal muscles depends on how much of it there is. So just like how we respond to strength training in terms of muscle uh, strengthening, it's dose dependent. So the more of it we do, the stronger we get. I mean, plus or minus, obviously there are other training considerations, um, but it's dose dependent just like with bone density. So more stressor tends to mean um, more strengthening and more bone density, you know, assuming we're not overdoing it and overtraining and so on. Uh, weight bearing and resistance exercise are optimal for growth and bone density. So if we want to increase bone density, we need to focus on weight bearing exercise and resistance exercise. So things that would strengthen our skeletal muscles and things that cause us to work against gravity. So any kind of resistance or strength training um, will all help with bone density and anything where we're working against gravity. So even if it's not specifically resistance based, um, maybe it could be like running or um, you know, other things that are not just lifting, you know, yoga, things like that, where we're working against gravity, those are all weight bearing and those will all help with bone density. So walking, running, hiking, strength training, you know, we could list activities all day long that would all qualify there. Uh, things that would not help particularly would be like swimming and cycling. Um, so although there's variable degree of resistance, it's usually not sufficient 
um, to consider it like strength training, like for skeletal muscle and in swimming and cycling, we're not really working against gravity. You know, like in swimming, there's the buoyancy effect. So we're really not working against gravity. It's more just the resistance of the water. Um, and so those types of exercise can be fantastic forms of exercise because they're not weight bearing. So people with joint problems and things like that, where uh, the impact is a problem, those are fantastic activities. But if bone density is the issue, then we need to be weight bearing um, or add more resistance. All right, well, that's all I have for you in this lecture and I'll see you for the next one.